My name is Father Jim Barron, and well, to begin tonight, I would just like to do a brief recap over what we covered on Tuesday night about the basics of prayer. Uh, you know, prayer, something is very human, and yet it's something that must be elevated by God, by His grace. And that's precisely what happens in our baptism. We receive the Holy Spirit, and as Christians, Christ, our divine head, prays in us. And so whenever the Father sees us praying, He sees His Son praying in us, and us praying as a member of that same body. And that the Holy Spirit that we have received at our baptism is the one who prays and makes our prayers even more acceptable to the Father. The whole point of Christian prayer is at its origin and ending because we want to know Christ and Him crucified. The final end of all prayer is union with God. We again can risk sometimes thinking that prayer is simply about well-being, that it's a psychological act, that I can achieve sort of an equilibrium uh, and therefore have a better life, where again Christian prayer is about union. There are some uh, approaches to prayer that come from you know, usually Eastern forms of prayer, but there have been some attempts to try to adopt these in, in Catholicism that can be very contrary to Christian prayer because it seeks to sort of empty oneself, to sort of open oneself to whatever. Rather, ours is about specifically seeking union with God, knowing that we'll never get rid of our minds because we are both head and heart. They're meant to be united and directed together towards that union with God. And so to help direct our mind, and we'll cover a little bit on distractions in prayer tonight, we have to feed it with good fuel to help calm it, to help direct it in the direction we want to go. The content that we can meditate with, that again is the union of head and heart, uh, we don't try to get rid of one or the other. That is not a, it's not a human prayer, but it's also especially not a Christian prayer. The nature of, of our life of prayer, situated in our entire spiritual lives, which includes the battle for virtue, the battle to root out sin. Prayer is not an isolated category in our lives, but rather is sort of the glue that binds and integrates every other aspect of our life together. It's not possible to have a vibrant prayer life and sort of have no effort uh, in seeking to grow closer to God by how we live. How we live, how we pray, how we believe, we're all very much connected. Our prayer is modeled off of Christ. Jesus is the Son of God, we are children of God, and so we imitate Him in His prayer. And by that, we help, uh, we allow Him, we give Him access to shape our hearts, our desires, that we might desire what He desires. Because his desire for us is, but nothing for our good, or nothing but for our good, rather. So we can trust that, that our prayer and the conformity of our desire to his is a good thing. It's a formation of our intellect and our will, and it's a training of that desire to imitate Christ's. Spoke briefly about how the Mass itself is the highest form of Christian prayer because it's the prayer of God himself, Jesus Christ's sacrifice, that prayer of his entire life consummated on the cross and then fulfilled in the resurrection is made present. And so when we come to Mass, that is the highest form of prayer we can offer because it's the prayer of Christ that we are united to. We also understand the liturgy of the church as being a way that we are conformed to the will of God, another way to conform our desires. I think it's important to remember, especially you know, if we find ourselves distracted in Mass, to think um, you know, that is where we learn to mean what we say. That the prayers of the Mass, the Gloria, for example, is that a genuine expression of my heart? If not, what's the gap? What's the difference? And how do I seek to make that up? How do I uh, allow this to shape me? The Mass uh, mentioned is sort of like play theory. We play as we will work, or we, we sort of practice as we will play, if you will, to use a sports analogy. And so we practice, if you will, in the Mass for eternity, in eternity of praising God, of being nourished by Him, 
of enjoying the vision of God forever in the company of our brothers and sisters. Nobody has their own individual heaven isolated from everybody else. Heaven is a communal event, and we have a foretaste of it in this life, which is why we have everybody come together for Mass as an image of that, a foretaste of that communal event. I spoke briefly about the different forms of prayer, blessing and adoration, prayers of petition, prayers of intercession, prayers of thanksgiving, then prayers of praise. These are all forms in which we can pray even throughout the day. But it's also important to have specific times of prayer that we set aside. The whole goal is very much to imitate our Blessed Mother. Throughout the Gospel of Luke in the first few chapters, one of the, the phrases that he includes about Our Lady is that she pondered these things in her heart. That Mary pondered these things that happened to her, that she encountered uh, in her heart. She lived a spirit of recollection. And that's the goal. You know, and a spirit of recollection doesn't mean that the world around us is calm and peaceful. It rather is able to navigate even chaos with that same spirit of having things sort of collected. And that doesn't just happen on its own. It really depends on specific moments where we stop to recollect. But then also throughout the day, trying to draw our minds and our hearts back to the Lord to try to maintain that same spirit of peace, of calm, so that we live in the world and respond to it, not just react to it. Life can go crazy around us, but again, as Christians, we have that call to live that peace that surpasses all understanding, the peace that Christ gave his apostles. It's really the peace that the martyrs go to their, their deaths in, within their hearts. It's the peace that can be exercised in the middle of a busy street or in the middle of a quiet a monastery. It takes cultivation. And it really is going to you know, look slightly different from Christian to Christian. However, it's that posture of being attentive to God's presence. To be aware that God is always with us. That God does take care of us. And that our hearts are kind of in that attitude. It's not, again, one that happens overnight. It takes a lot of practice and cultivation that we have to sort of do things to help dispose that attitude or that disposition. And so this touches again how our lives are very much, how our lives very much influence our prayer. I've uh, had the privilege of teaching our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders this week, and we were talking about the golden calf. And of course, I use bad jokes about, I don't mean tan legs, but the golden calf. That was worshipped by the Hebrews after they thought that Moses uh, was pulverized in the smithereens or lost or whatever happened to him. And to be aware of the various golden calves in our lives that might tempt us away from God. Part of the, the egregious nature of that sin was that they tried to make God in their own image. Rather than approach God as he is, he called himself, I am who am. So when we approach God, it's not necessarily on our terms. They're on His. But to do so with, again, that trust, knowing that He does love us and wants our good even more than we do. But the, the Hebrews' sin of sort of trying to fashion a God after their own likeness and sort of approach God as they saw fit, um, that, that can translate into so many areas of our daily lives. Other ways that we might try to rationalize something or pretend, you know, God may or may not be this way uh, because it justifies what, I'm ha what I happen to be doing. Uh, sometimes these golden calves, uh, well, every golden calf eventually comes back to devour its worshiper. Uh, God drew the people out of Egypt away from these gods and the worship of idols uh, always, again, led to usually the downfall of the worshiper. Whereas our worship of God elevates us, fulfills us. In the prayers of the preface of the Mass, it is our duty and our salvation that what God calls us to do is for our good, our deepest good, and our eternal good. So with these kids, I was encouraging them to consider the various golden calves in our lives that might try to draw us away from right relationship with God 
to be aware of them because ultimately they will come back to devour us. And some of the examples that they gave of golden calves that they recognized in their own lives would be things like sports, technology, laziness, so on and so forth, that it might seem very enticing, but before you know it, it's all consuming. We'll take sports, for example. You know, sometimes those schedules just begin to take over every spare moment that we have. You know, we don't necessarily like it, but we do it. And the schedule keeps getting more and more all-encompassing because nobody says no. The commandments, God's uh, call to us is to protect us from forms of slavery, to protect us from these lesser gods that, again, turn on their adorers and devour them. Through our recommitting every day to follow God, to try to keep his commandments, to try to conform our life to his will for our lives, and to seek to cultivate that life of prayer, we're responding to God's invitation to freedom. But as we know, if you've ever seen somebody uh, play the piano with great proficiency, they play it and it looks effortless. But we know that it probably is after hours and hours and hours of labor and effort. They play freely after having exercised great discipline. And so the discipline that we seek to put into our lives of prayer will bear fruit. But we still have to put in that discipline, that effort, if you will. So we have these various forms of prayer that we can do any time of the day. And it's actually very helpful to maintain that spirit of recollection, to acknowledge God's presence in the middle of your day. And you know, I left my phone in the sacristy, but use the phone for good. Uh, it's got alarms on it. Set the alarm at a certain time and remind yourself to stop, to pray, to recognize where is God? What is he doing? to elevate your heart, to think of something that you are thankful for, to intercede for somebody, to praise God, simply to adore in his presence. So again, those are things that we can do throughout our day, but we need that specific time to sort of meditate, to help fuel our minds and our hearts with the word of God. In scripture, in the writings of a saint, or in various icons or uh, pieces of liturgical art, the form of meditation, something that we'll get into a bit, uh, that's going to look different for most of us, one from the other. Last night we had a guided meditation, and that may have been very helpful for some, that may have been very unhelpful for some, depending on our temperament, depending on how we sort of engage or are engaged. We are each different, you know, and that's okay, that's a good thing. And God works differently in each soul. And a large part is in relationship to the temperament or the personality that he has blessed us with. And so, some, having that, uh, that writing from St. Jose Maria last night might have been helpful because it sort of evokes either intellectually or affectively something that, stand, that stood out to you, that you kind of chomp down on and chew on a bit. Others, it might not have been so helpful because we might be much more visual in our imagination. St. Ignatius of Loyola, with his 30-day uh, spiritual exercises, and a lot of this Ignatian spirituality really is based more on the use of the imagination, sort of taking a scripture passage, and it's heavily rooted in scripture. Say, for example, the nativity coming up. Imagine the place. What does the, the building or the cave look like? Is it cold? What is the smell? Is there damp hay? Maybe the smell of manure? What are Mary and Joseph doing? What are you doing in that scene? Put yourself right in the midst of that scene. You know, do they need to fire wood? Is the baby Jesus in his manger yet? Or did you get there beforehand? sort of developing the scene with your imagination. That is much more helpful for some than others. There's uh, what could be sometimes called a Franciscan approach, which is much more sort of, it's very based on scripture as well, meditating on the person of Christ in an effort to imitate him more directly. 
St. Francis was said to be the most Christ-like person who's lived in the church. And he took that imitation of Christ very literally. And so the Franciscan tradition is oftentimes applying scripture to one's life to shape one's reactions, how one lives. Uh, so it's very practical. Uh, but again, it's rooted in scripture and they're very, very dedicated to that daily time of meditation. There are other forms of devotional meditation. A famous work is the imitation of Christ. That isn't so much an engagement of the intellect, although it's there. It's much more trying to engage the affect through experiences of sorrow, of sympathy, of perhaps joy, drawing on a spirit of humility, uh, and, and ultimately our unworthiness before a loving God who reaches out to us. There's a form that could be more properly called Thomistic, in that it sort of is based more on contemplation of divine truths that's more intellectual than affective. Neither of them abandons the other, but it really does engage, and it would be something of reading scripture or the catechism, or another thing, again, for the intellectual content that kind of sets us off into the aha moment. That might be the way that somebody is, uh, finds greater fruit in prayer. So to sort of explore or experiment with these different types of prayer can be very helpful. You know, if perhaps you want to try a week's worth of that imagination, engaging the imagination, the compositio locis, the composition of place, if you will. And how do we sort of place ourselves in that? What do we see happening? Uh, that Ignatian approach, again, is, is very helpful. It helps develop the imagination, which is essential for our prayer life. That Franciscan model. Uh, St. Francis, if you didn't know, basically invented the nativity scene as a way to try to uh, draw inspiration to the poverty of God in Christ. You know, really in vogue up to his time was uh, a lot of majesty, the majesty of the Christ child and of God. And he, by creating the nativity scene and with all of its pieces and its setting, was trying to engage the imagination in another way, to see the poverty of God, inspiring us to imitate that same humility. St. Thomas Aquinas, again, a, a towering intellect, was also very contemplative. He was a mystic as well. He wasn't just brains. He was very much head and heart, but he had profoundly mystical experiences at the end of his life uh, as he was finishing or had yet to finish one of his uh, most famous works. He was praying before a crucifix in Naples, Italy with his books that he was working on. And he heard from the cross Jesus say, you have written well of me, Thomas. What do you want? And Thomas's reply was, nothing but yourself, Lord. And so having a mystical experience, when he came to, he is recorded to have said, everything I've written is so much straw to what I have seen. And he wasn't trying to say that what he had written was nothing, but that what it was pointing towards, the divine truth that he was allowed to see face to face is the fulfillment of anything that would be just shadows. It doesn't mean that they're wrong, but they lag so far behind the reality that they describe. And so again, what is my temperament? What do I draw fruit from? Feel free to experiment with these different types of prayer, or meditation rather. But again, these all need both intentionality and content. If we are developing our spiritual life or our prayer life, or even if we're fairly far into it, it's not a bad thing to have some content. The catechism is a good thing. Uh, the scriptures, obviously, is, is very good. Um, different writings of saints that we sit with, that we pray with. Uh, and we try it for a period of time. We're funny human creatures that we like habits. We might not believe that, but we really do. Our brain likes to make associations and patterns that develop habits so that it doesn't have to expend as much energy on repeated actions. Think about how much effort it might have taken to tie your shoes this morning. 
or brush your teeth? Probably not, because you've done it so long for you know so much for so long that it is just second nature. Your brain doesn't have to think a lot about it. And so developing a habit of prayer is much the same thing. That to set a particular time of day, and we'll start to know the more we pay attention to it, what is a better time of day for me than another time? Meaning that when I can pray, but then also when I'm attentive. You know, it might seem like a fine idea to try to pray right before going to bed or maybe in bed with the covers tucked up to your chin and then all of a sudden we're asleep. Uh, maybe not. That might not be our best time. But drawing on something I had said Tuesday, that we have to pray as we can, not as we can't. So what is a time of day that I could do something consistently? Excuse me, that's ideal. Perhaps it's in the morning. If you need to have a cup of coffee with it, fine. Um, you know, if you need to be sitting, kneeling, standing, whatever helps dispose you to that attitude of prayer. Part of the composition of place is helpful as well. Our setting, our environment. It's a bit more difficult to you know, pray on a street corner than it might be in a church. Why? Because the environment around us is conducive to prayer. So in your home, if that's where you're going to set about praying, set aside a place for it. Get a chair that is comfortable enough, but perhaps not a lazy boy. Um, maybe if, that, if you can stay awake. Uh, set up a little, maybe a, an altar with a crucifix or uh, an icon or an image of Our Lady. Put a candle or two by it and light the candles when you pray to kind of, again, set the mood and do it regularly. Routine is our friend. Routine isn't the point, it's a means to the end, but it's a very helpful means. We should use the means at our disposal. And so setting the place, the time of day, it might take a week or you might, usually here's what happens. We get very convicted that yes, I'm going to do this. We do it for a week and then we think, all right, I got a week, I can take a day break. Then we take two days and then three days. Then all of a sudden, oops. So, again, pray as you can, not as you can't. If it's seven minutes, that's a great seven minutes, if that's what you've got. If you can go 10 minutes, if you can go 20 minutes, nobody is saying it. It most likely wouldn't be good for most of us in this room to try to start out praying for two hours. You, know, you might have that habit. You might have that luxury. If so, good on you. Keep it up. But if we don't, don't think that seven minutes is a sham. It's not. If it's consistent, that's really the key. Consistency is king when it comes to developing a life of prayer. But then also perseverance. Perseverance in prayer. Not only trying to show up, and it's true that success is 90% showing up, to try to be faithful to that time, but then also if it starts to you know, we might have a great first week, a great second week, and then it starts to taper off. The enthusiasm might start to wane. We might start to get drowsy because that type of habit starts to set and it becomes familiar. Don't give up. Don't say, oh, this is a wash. That fidelity and perseverance is very important, even in the face of drowsiness or distraction. What is most important in prayer is what God is doing, less so as what we're doing. God is delighted simply in our existence. So let's acknowledge that first. But even accepting his invitation to come away, to be with him in quiet, to seek him. What a beautiful expression of responding to his grace, to his invitation. And so if it doesn't look perfect, God knows our weakness. God knows our desire to please him. And even if that, I mean, if that can be much more fruitful prayer, believe it or not, with God seeing us persevere through things that aren't necessarily fun at this time. Or I might not be feeling a lot of affective response in this 20 minutes, but I show up nonetheless. God can bring tremendous fruit from those types of struggles. Now, if it comes to our temperament or how these different methods of meditation might be greater or lesser help. 
those are something that I would give ourselves, you know, two weeks to try. You know, try two weeks, and if there's no fruit being born, or if it's just really impossible, then try another one. You know, maybe go on from the imagination to, uh, you know, kind of reading uh, for the sort of contemplation of divine truth, more of an intellectual approach. There's, uh, there's actually some work that's been done on trying to figure out or align the Myers-Briggs personality types with these different prayer types, and it seems to be fairly helpful. Um, I think the book is called On Prayer and Temperament, uh, and it kind of goes through, through those things in general. But you know, again, so there might be forms of meditation that might be more or less helpful. So give it a few weeks, two weeks, and if it's completely a wash, you know, don't change your prayer time necessarily, but maybe change your method. When you choose a prayer time, down the road that might become obvious that that needs to change after a while too, but don't change everything at once. Try one thing for a time, and then if that doesn't work, maybe change just one thing, not two or three things. So then you can kind of diagnose what exactly is more conducive to this time of prayer. Is it the, the method I'm using? Is it the time? Is it the chair that I picked? I don't know. Um, you know, that's, that's something for your own diagnostic. Uh, but that perseverance is very important. There's something called dryness in prayer. This is a common challenge. Oftentimes in our earlier conversions or earlier stages of our prayer life, the Lord holds us, he sustains us through great consolation. The language of consolation is kind of an effective, um, sort of an effective high, if you will. It's that we, we delight in prayer, we're eager to come, that we get life from it. So the consolations are very good, and God sustains us. But then if those consolations go away, that doesn't mean that God's dropped us. Sometimes we experience what is properly called a dryness in prayer after a while, because the Lord wants us to set our roots deeper. The image that I think is helpful to use uh, a priest friend of mine was uh, a student at Arizona State, and apparently in one of their quads, they planted all these trees, and they were fed on the sprinkler system that the rest of the grass in the quad was, was watered with. And then one day, months later, a big windstorm came and knocked over all of the trees. And the moral of the story is that they watered them on the surface, therefore they didn't have roots that went deep. So sometimes the Lord will allow dryness in our prayer counting on our perseverance so that our roots can go deeper, that we have a more serious approach to our spiritual life, our prayer, a commitment that is really proven through that perseverance. And then usually those are signs that the Lord wants to take us even deeper, that he wants us to go even more close to his heart, to lead us to another stage, if you will. As our lives are connected to our prayer, uh, different saints have spoken about three different sort of ages or ways in our life writ large, but included in our prayer life. The first one they would call the via purgativa, meaning when we are shown more and more through the grace of God our imperfections. After we set about trying to live a faithful discipleship, uh, after we seek to really fight against intentionally mortal sins, things that would separate us from God, the grace of God can start to reveal more and more our weaknesses, our imperfections, spots on our hearts, if you will. And sometimes that can be frightening when we get a, a clearer picture of our life in reality, but we shouldn't be frightened because that means that the light of God is shining in us. Uh, some saints have used the image of a dark room or a pitch black room that if you're in it, you don't know anything's wrong. But then as soon as the shutters start to open and light comes in, you see a chair knocked over, papers scattered on the desk, you see the trash can overflowing, you see smudges and dust on the window pane. And the more and more that light shines through, the more and more imperfections you see. And that can be very frightening. But we have to remember that we're only seeing it because the light is coming in. So the Lord will reveal to us 
more and more perhaps our imperfections that they might be gotten rid of, that they might be sort of turned away from, so that via purgativa, or purging, if you will, is very much related to that illumination of God in our living, how we are, uh, how our lives are. Then the second phase is that via illuminativa, meaning that it's sort of more illuminative, not just in regards to our sins, but also to the truths of God, the truths of our faith that we start to see more and more of the connections, the action of God uh, in my life and in the world. And then the third phase they would call the via unitiva, that the whole point of prayer is union with God, that we start to have it more and more, even in this life. That's when we really start to see those who ponder these things in their heart, who have that kind of constant presence of God in their day-to-day -day life. Now we shouldn't think that once I leave one, I'm in the other, no turning back. Sometimes we navigate all three at different times of our lives. Um, and that's going to happen. But knowing that the end, the goal, where we want to be is that unitive place with God. And that perseverance, again, that perseverance is essential. Uh, to not give up. To not be discouraged. To think that this is, this is taking longer than I thought. I want results now. You know, we're working on God's time, not our own. And sometimes it's that anticipation of something that isn't meeting our expectations. It's actually the most salubrious thing for us that can be tremendously helpful to our deepest being. God works deeply in our lives, more deeply than we realize. An old spiritual director of mine would say that we're cleaning the windshield. God's working on the engine. And that sometimes we might not even recognize what the Lord's doing or has been doing in our lives until perhaps years down the road when we can look back and say, oh wow, I get it. And that might not be till after we die. Who knows? But it is very helpful for our life of discipleship in general, but especially our prayer life, to from time to time stop and sort of take an inventory of your life. What have been significant moments where I can say that God has been there, that he has acted, maybe through someone, some encounter, some opportunity, some contradiction or frustration? Where has God been? What has been my journey of faith, to use a common expression? And to really see that in front of us. St. John of the Cross said that one of the greatest enemies of the spiritual life is a bad memory. And we might have bad memories, you know, humanly speaking, but the worst is to not try to remember, to sort of not look back. So much of the identity of the people of God in Scripture is the memory of their history as an indicator of who they are. When the prophets would oftentimes address the people of God. When Moses uh, came to the Hebrews, he said, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, trying to call their mind back to remember what God has done for them. Therefore, he is trustworthy and he is present. So to look at our own personal histories, our own faith lives, to see that God has been present, he is faithful, and he remains present is very important so that's you know something that I would recommend again taking maybe an hour or so to think about it to write it down um, I don't like writing things down that's why it's so important for me to do so uh, journaling is very popular in in meditation and prayer because there might be some points that just strike you right between the eyes that you want to write down have something to write it down there may be something in your meditation that really stands out. You want to copy it and keep it with you throughout the day so that you can come back to it and keep drawing fruit from it. If you have a powerful experience in prayer or maybe in your life that it's clear that God is there and it provides great consolation, remember that. Come back to it. Keep drawing fruit from that. Sometimes we sort of have an experience and then we want to move on to the next one. All right, God, what's next? What do you got for me? 
And meanwhile, he's saying, no, I already did something that I want you to spend more time on. So to sort of take note of those things, literally sometimes to take note so that you can come back and read it again. You know, maybe describe not only the actual uh, thought or the occurrence, but then also what it inspired in you. What did it make you feel? How did you uh, respond to this to, to help jog your memory when you come back? And then some point maybe that might stop bearing fruit for you in prayer. That's okay. But as long as it does, it's a good place to go. We can always have that as a little gift from God, kind of an Easter egg that we can always remember and come back to and, and find something there that's tangible. The Catechism speaks about prayer as a battle. Whenever I talk about this, I always think of, is it Pat Benatar, Love as a Battlefield? I gave that analogy in a homily once and somebody chastised me afterwards. Not for using a Pat Benatar song, but just the idea of battle. And they thought that battle or warfare, spiritual warfare, wasn't a Christian idea. It's a deeply Christian idea. That sometimes we have to really look at it as a campaign, a battle, something that we must be very intentional about and realize that we're going to meet resistance and we have to strategize. We really have to be diligent and intentional about how we approach this. They say, the battle of, in the battle of prayer, we must face in ourselves and around us erroneous notions of prayer. Some people view prayer as a simple psychological activity, others as an effort of concentration to reach a mental void. Still others reduce prayer to ritual words and postures. Many Christians unconsciously regard prayer as an occupation that is incompatible with all the other things they have to do. They don't have time. Those who seek God by prayer are quickly discouraged because they do not know that prayer also comes from the Holy Spirit and not from themselves alone. So that as we understand it as a battle, it's not ours to fight primarily. It's God fighting within us. We are fighting under his banner so that we have the greatest ally in this battle. That sometimes these false notions or experiences in our lives that can discourage us from prayer to recognize that. Like uh, Romano Gordini mentioned that we quoted the other night, that sometimes we kid ourselves into thinking that we either are too tired or that we don't have time for prayer, when rather it would be much more helpful to just say, I don't feel like praying, to sort of be honest with ourselves about it. Because it's from that posture of honesty that we can consider the way forward. And so in this battle of prayer, the Catechism goes on to name a few, a few particular things. And one of the first things that it mentions is distractions. I mentioned briefly on Tuesday that if we face distractions in prayer, sometimes that can be an indication, uh, well, always it's an indication of where our heart is, what our priorities are. The distractions will be there when we're done with prayer, so we should try to make an effort to kind of put them on a shelf. Maybe if you're a visually imaginative person, kind of imagine putting them in a box, putting them on a shelf by the door, and you'll get it on your way out. Sometimes those distractions keep coming back, and that might be a sign that the Lord wants to talk about this, that he wants you to consider this, to sort of open up that box and think, what exactly is the Lord trying to say? we shouldn't really try to chase them down all the time. When we consider them, we sort of lay them before the Lord and say, what do you want to do with this? Rather, a distraction, uh, if we try to find the root of it, then all of a sudden, 20 minutes have gone by and we haven't prayed. We've just tried to figure out the source of the distraction. So even if it keeps coming back and back, perhaps again, visually imagine putting that before the feet of the Lord or in front of the altar as kind of a way to hand it over to God. Sometimes, again, if we are drowsy or if we are distracted, the best we can do is to try to maintain that posture of vigilance, of attentiveness, as much as we can. It's not always going to happen, and it's not always going to happen easily. 
but to sort of, again, have that posture of heart of being ready, ready for the coming of the bridegroom, like those ten virgins that had the oil in their lamps, so that we can at least be ready for whatever the Lord has to do. Sometimes we hear a lot, you know, I, I end up saying more in prayer than listening. And this is a good practice to it in a certain time of your prayer, is to say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And try to maintain that posture of attentiveness without necessarily needing to say anything. The Catechism goes on again to speak about dryness, uh, in particular belonging to contemplative prayer, when the heart is separated from God, with no taste for thoughts, memories, and feelings, even spiritual ones. This is a moment of sheer faith, clinging faithfully to Jesus in his agony and in his tomb. If the last thing I want to do is pray, and yet we, pray, we go to prayer, imagine that excuse me, we are there with Christ in his hour in agony, that he is there praying in the garden, and that we sort of unite our, dif our difficulty, our dryness, to his. So sometimes that dryness the Lord allows to deepen our roots, but then sometimes, especially in contemplation, he'll allow it to experience that desolation that Christ experienced. That's part of the union with Jesus. Union with Jesus is never without the cross, but it always is with the resurrection. Very important to remember in our prayer that we shouldn't expect it to always be very filled with consolation. Sometimes it might not be, but that in itself is a taste of union with our Lord. Sometimes there are going to be uh, various temptations in prayer, things that might pop into our heads or a desire to leave or you know, various other temptations that the catechism reminds us to be united to Christ, to remain in that disposition of a humble heart, really allowing our poverty to be revealed to us. That humility that we spoke about on Tuesday that is essential for beginning our prayer, a life of prayer, is ultimately recognizing our utter poverty that it's God who must accomplish this within us, that so many things about us are trying to take us away, turn us aside, that we really come before the Lord with empty hands. And sometimes those temptations that we face in prayer are a very vivid reminder of that. There's another temptation that the Catechism describes called Echadia. That's not a state park in Maine. Echadia it's, some have described it as the spirit of Achadia. Spiritual writers understand by this a form of depression due to lax ascetical practice, decreasing vigilance, carelessness of heart. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Achadia is sort of a spiritual blah. And oftentimes we don't see it coming, but we all of a sudden find ourselves in it. It usually, again, has to do with kind of letting our spiritual practices slide, a lukewarmness, uh, a sloth, if you will. Then all of a sudden, we are just kind of in a funk, a blah, that it really isn't easy to get out of. It takes an act of charity, an act of the will, either specifically you know, seeking to renew with great commitment that life of prayer, performing an act of charity for another, spiritual or corporal work of mercy. But it can be, again, something that sneaks up on us that we don't notice. So to really maintain these habits uh, are helpful because we kind of get a baseline against which we can measure how we're doing. You know, if we have a habit and our hearts react in different ways as the weeks go on, we can notice this. Like, this isn't just me being out of routine. I've been in my routine, and so therefore there's something else happening that I need to pay attention to. There's sometimes a frustration about, uh, well, I guess it would be more discouragement of, we don't think it's working, if you will. It might be prayers of petition, why is God not hearing me, or intercession for another. Uh, it might be again after a prolonged period. And that's something that each individual soul will experience in a different way. But to, again, recognize if nothing else, 
that we can be drawn to that trust of it as a child of God that somehow, some way, God is trying to bring something very important from this, even if it takes a long time. God's much more patient than we are. And so to ask the Lord for that grace of perseverance, that's very important. Um, yeah, I'll quote Babe Ruth again. You can never beat the person who never gives up. That's very important for our prayer life. So our prayer life, commitment to that specific time of prayer with meditation, seeking always being open from that to contemplation, which is a gift. But that helps to infuse the rest of our interior lives and our lives of discipleship. It's really, uh, prayer is not a luxury. Prayer is not a luxury. It's a necessity. It's something that we really have to, to include. That is part of our Christian life. But it's something, again, that it's very simple, but it's not always easy. And what is difficult isn't always complex. Um, I got a quick kind of question from Tuesday, uh, or two questions that I'll address quickly and then open it up for any questions that we might have here. This one was more about related to that sort of the efficaciousness of our prayer or the prayers of, of petition. And it was about sort of the world situation. And is, is, are the crises that we see going on in the world, is that kind of God sort of punishing us, if you will, or trying to um, bring about something to, you know, th this isn't what the question asks, but is God trying to sort of force our hand into something because we've been neglecting prayer? Or is he trying to punish us because of that? Uh, scripture says that the wages of sin is death, that our own neglect in the world, our own sins, uh, they really pay for themselves. Uh, they bring around their own punishment. God you know, doesn't necessarily need to bring about a Sodom and Gomorrah for us to feel the, the consequences of our wrong actions. And so oftentimes what we see in the news uh, yeah, God is allowing it because he wants us to respond in freedom and he wants us to respond with love but it's not necessarily that sort of God is bringing it about in an intentional way he's passively allowing it to, exact, to happen to occur but it's not necessarily that he's actively making it to occur or these situations to occur um, again our, our actions have consequences all their own that the Lord doesn't need to necessarily intervene to, you know, for us to experience the, those consequences. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, excuse me. The other question was about a little bit more on contemplative prayer. Uh, I'll just go right from the catechism. This is a much more eloquent and concise than I could say. What is contemplative prayer? St. Teresa answers, contemplative prayer, in my opinion, is nothing else than a close sharing between friends. It means taking time frequently to be alone with him who we know loves us. Contemplative prayer seeks him whom my soul loves. It is Jesus and in him the Father. We seek him because to desire him is always the beginning of love. And we seek him in that pure faith which causes us to be born of him and to live in him. In this inner prayer, we can still meditate, but our attention is fixed on the Lord himself. So this is a gift that is, a, is given to us because we can correspond to it by our being present, by our openness, you know, partly through those habits that have been built up and our habitual life of prayer that we are able to receive this gift from God. Now it makes a distinction between meditation and contemplation. Meditation is you know, reading the life of Christ in Scripture, the words of the Lord, uh, con contemplating the various mysteries of our redemption, for example, in the Rosary. Contemplation is, if you will, a direct encounter with the Lord. That, you know, if, if meditation is reading the menu, contemplation is eating the steak. Um, so to understand that this is a gift only given by God, but it's not something that comes out of the blue. 
Very rarely. It happens, but very rarely. Rather, it's usually concomitant with our dispositions that have been developed. And so, to not expect, you know, contemplation right away. You know, if the Lord chooses to give that to you, praise God. But it's not something that just normally happens. It kind of follows in tandem with that development of a life of prayer. So that, you know, God gets us in a place that he can have a conversation with us. If we never stop to have that conversation, it's harder to do so. So, Let me open it up for any questions you might have. Or thoughts, even. If you don't, it's okay, too. I don't want to put any pressure on anybody. What was the name of the book you read from yesterday? That was Christ is Passing By by St. Jose Maria Escriva. And it kind of goes through the whole liturgical year with a series of meditations. Uh, but that one was very appropriate for Lent, I think. Yes? Father, I thought it was very ironic um, today I heard on the news that a politician had tweeted out last night that our thoughts and prayers were with the victims. And a newspaper, their headline said, God isn't fixing this and chastised people who are saying that prayers and thoughts are enough. And I thought the timing with your series on prayer was just very timely. Um, it is a spiritual warfare and attack on those of us who believe in prayer and faith. Yeah. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a great temptation to cynicism. Uh, especially those that have probably already somewhere rejected the idea of a loving or provident God. Um, you know, today's gospel, in fact, Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the, the one who does the will of my Father. And so there's something very much about prayer and our faith. In, in the West, there's been a divorce of faith from charity, meaning works. You know, the, this idea that we hear a lot of faith alone, sola fide, um, that's not a Christian idea. That's kind of a reworking uh, of scripture. But it's faith, if we understand what faith is, that it necessarily manifests itself in works. And faith is not divorced from charity or action, but rather it flowers in it. In the epistle of James, he says, you know, show me faith without works and I'll show you the faith that underlies my works. Uh, that faith that works is dead. Uh, so when, I guess, Gal, in answer to a teaspoon question, uh, prayer's essential, never to be discounted, but to also think sometimes, uh, it's like when we pass somebody in the, in the hallway and we say, oh, how you doing? As we're walking by, you know, we have no intention of stopping to hear how, how they're doing. Sometimes that, that phrase can be just kind of off the cuff. So we should be, you know, if we say that, we should mean it. You know, if we say, I'm going to pray for you or I'm praying for this, no, yes, let's pray for it. And never discount that because it is, it is God who is our Savior. Uh, we know that. Um, I had the privilege of being able to preach a homily yesterday to our school kids about uh, there's a lot of folks, in, especially in the last hundred years, that have tried to make heaven on, tried to make heaven on earth. You know, communism, fascism, trying to arrange a perfect society all on their own. And look what it did. You know, they became the, mo the most bloody and horrendous efforts in humankind. As Christians, we already know not only the ending to the story, but very much the themes that we'll see along the way, that we need God, and God is the one who has to, to save us, that our dependence is on God. Uh, but God wants to work in us and through us as well. The God-given gift of our reason and our sociability, seeking towards the common good, is, is also how God wants to work. Um, and so how prayer can form our desires as well, that we pray that we might be open to do what God wants us to do in a given situation. Uh, the Arabs have a phrase 
uh, trust in God, tie up your camel also. So, does that make sense? So yeah, we, there are people who disparage the idea of prayer and trust in God because they've probably already rejected God as you know, wholesale, let alone as Savior. We know that God is our Savior, that the Messiah has come, and look how they treated him, so, and he it will come again. And that until then, we're not going to make heaven on earth. Yes, sir. Yeah, St. Augustine, he who prays. Yeah. Um, there's something very unique about that with our humanity. It's hard to sing and be upset. Yeah, try it. <laughs> uh, unless you're maybe singing some screamo, heavy metal, death metal, I don't know. Um, but the idea of singing is very liturgical. Uh, in fact, actually in the Eastern Church, part of discernment to the priesthood includes whether or not you can sing. You know, if you can't, then God's probably not calling you. Uh, prayer is very important part of the liturgy. But then also, praying is, or singing, it really does enact kind of the, our, af, excuse me, our affect in a beautiful way. And it kind of engages more of our humanity. So there is something about praying, uh, or singing as prayer. You know, listening? listening you know, that can be as very true as well. Uh, beauty. Beauty is a very effective way where God uh, re is reflected in his creation, either through visual or audio, and kind of draws us into a transcendent experience. You know, should that be the only form of prayer? I would say no, especially considering you know, when Elijah was brought to Mount Carmel and you know, God said that he would reveal himself. There was the, the, the fiery wind, or there was the fire, then the heavy wind, uh, and then there was the... The silence and the still small voice. You know, God is very much about a quiet encounter as well. So, both and, not either or. So. Yes. Um, it, not necessarily. Um, the, the traditional Ignatian spiritual exercise is 30 days, and within that 30 days, you can experience the entire gamut of human emotion. Um, so it might not necessarily be dryness, it might be kind of a, a time for perseverance. So, but then again, it could be discerned. I have to discern that one. No, I mean, if you ever want to talk more about it, feel free to send me an email. But not necessarily, so, yeah, try this. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Um, well, then, let's do this. Let's close with just a few quiet moments of prayer. Um, then I'll actually kind of, we'll, we'll close in prayer um, and then just kind of leave as you will. Feel free to stay and you know, pray or just be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty and merciful Father, you provide for everything we need. You are always present. That you are more intimate to us than we even are to ourselves. Please bless us with your Holy Spirit. Renew that gift that has been given to us in our baptism. He whom you poured into our hearts at our confirmation. That divine spirit who animates the life of the Christian. Please give us the grace of perseverance in prayer. Illumine our hearts and fire our wills that we might be eager to seek you, to seek union with your Son, entrusting all of our needs, those that are obvious and those that aren't so obvious to us. 
we entrust them to the maternal care of Our Lady. As we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And then we could just leave it silent.